direction to compensate for the Earth's rotation. The telescope is a kind of clock. You're clear. This work was difficult, routine, tedious. But although they didn't yet know it, Hubble and Hummison were meticulously accumulating the evidence for the Big Bang. They had found that the more distant the galaxy, the more its spectrum of colors was shifted to the red. All right, clear the telescope. I'm coming down now. If this red shift were due to the Doppler effect, the distant galaxies must be running away from us. At the end of his vigil, Hummison would retrieve the tiny galactic spectrum and carefully carry it down to be developed. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. I'm going to the dark room now. Good day. Good day, sir. Hummison found a redshift in almost every galaxy he examined, like the Doppler shift and the sound of a receding locomotive. And the farther away from us they were, the faster they were receding. Tied to the fabric of space, the outward rushing galaxies were tracing the expansion of the universe itself. An awesome conclusion had been captured on these tiny glass slides. Hummison and Hubble had discovered the Big Bang. At top and bottom are calibration lines that Hummison had earlier photographed. In the middle, is the spectrum of a relatively nearby galaxy. Every element has a characteristic spectral fingerprint, a set of frequencies where light is absorbed. Prominent here are two dark lines in the violet due to calcium in the atmospheres of the hundreds of billions of stars that constitute this galaxy. Nearby galaxies show very little Doppler shift. But when he recorded the spectrum of a fainter and more distant galaxy, he found the same telltale pair of lines, but shifted farther right toward the red. And when he examined a remote galaxy four billion light years away, he found that the lines were red shifted even more. This galaxy must be receding at 200 million kilometers an hour. The painstaking observations of Milton Hummison, astronomer and former mule team driver, established the expansion of the universe. In discussing the large-scale structure of the cosmos, astronomers sometimes say that space is curved, or that the universe is uh, finite but unbounded. Whatever are they talking about? Let's imagine that we are perfectly flat. I mean absolutely flat, and that we live, appropriately enough, in a flatland. A land designed and named by Edwin Abbott, a Shakespearean scholar who lived in Victorian England. Everybody in flatland is, of course, exceptionally flat. We have squares, and circles, and triangles, and we all scurry about, and we can go into our houses and do our flat business. Now, we have width and length, but no height at all. Now, these little cutouts have some little height, but uh, let's ignore that. Let's imagine that these are absolutely flat. That being the case, we know, us flatlanders, about left, right, and we know about forward, back, but we have never heard of up, down. Let us imagine that into flatland, hovering above it, comes a strange three-dimensional creature, which, oddly enough, looks like an apple. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square, watches it enter its house, and decides in a gesture of interdimensional amity to say hello. 
Hello, says the three-dimensional creature. How are you? I am a visitor from the third dimension. Well, the poor square looks around his closed house, sees no one there, and what's more, has witnessed a greeting coming from his insides, a voice from within. He surely is getting a little worried about his sanity. The three-dimensional creature is unhappy about being considered a psychological aberration, and so he descends to actually enter Flatland. Now, a three-dimensional creature exists in Flatland only partially. Only a plane, a cross-section through him can be seen. So when the three-dimensional creature first reaches Flatland, it's only the points of contact which can be seen. And we'll represent that by stamping the apple in this ink pad and placing that image in Flatland. And as the apple were to descend through, slither by Flatland, we would progressively see higher and higher slices, which we can represent by cutting the apple. So the square, as time goes on, sees a set of objects mysteriously appear from nowhere and inside a closed room and change their shape dramatically. His only conclusion could be that he's gone bonkers. Well, the apple might be a little annoyed at this conclusion, and so not such a friendly gesture from dimension to dimension, makes a contact with the square from below and sends our flat creature fluttering and spinning above flatland. At first, the square has no idea of what's happening. He's terribly confused. This is utterly outside his experience. But after a while, he comes to realize that he is seeing inside closed rooms in Flatland. He is looking inside his fellow flat creatures. He is seeing Flatland from a perspective no one has ever seen it before to his knowledge. Getting into another dimension provides as an incidental benefit a kind of X-ray vision. Now our flat creature slowly descends to the surface and his friends rush up to see him. From their point of view, he has mysteriously appeared from nowhere. He hasn't walked from somewhere else. He's come from some other place. They say, for heaven's sake, what's happened to you? And the poor square has to say, well, I was in some other mystic dimension called up. And they will pat him on his side and comfort him, or else they'll ask, well, show us, where is that three dimen third dimension? Point to it. And the poor square will be unable to comply. But maybe more interesting is the other direction in dimensionality. What about the fourth dimension? Now, to approach that, let's consider a cube. We can imagine a cube in the following way. You take a line segment and move it at right angles to itself an equal length. That makes a square. Move that square an equal length at right angles to itself, and you have a cube. Now, this cube, we understand, um, casts a shadow. And that shadow, we recognize. It's, you know, ordinarily drawn in uh, third grade classrooms as two squares with their vertices connected. Now, if we look at the shadow of a three-dimensional object in two dimensions, we see that, in this case, not all the lines appear equal. Not all the angles are right angles. The three-dimensional object has not been perfectly represented in its projection in two dimensions, but that's part of the cost of losing a dimension in the projection. Now, let's take this three-dimensional cube and project it, carry it, to a fourth physical dimension. Not that way, not that way, not that way, but at right angles to those three directions. I can't show you what direction that is, but imagine that there is a fourth physical dimension. In that case, we would generate a four-dimensional hypercube, which is also called a tesseract. I cannot show you a tesseract because I and you are trapped in three dimensions.